All right. <clears throat> so you're seeing some familiar faces up here, and you've been introduced to them before, um, all, most of them, other than Dixon. So I'm going to be somewhat brief with the introductions. First of all, we have Director Mike Chibita, <coughs> who is the Director of Public Prosecutions for Uganda, which is a very, very important job. We've already heard about 500 employees and 100 offices and all these other things. And uh, so we know what he's up to. I do, instead of giving him an introduction based on uh, his CV, let me just give one in terms of a, a brief story to give you a kind of idea of, of what, what he's all about, what he's like. Uh, we've been working on an ethics book, a legal ethics book or legal professionalism book. I have some, of that, some other actual authors here, in the, here in, the, in the room that have written a few things for the book. But for Uganda, because uh, we don't have a legal professionalism book in Uganda, and I had one particular justice, who will go unnamed, who was supposed to write the article about uh, judicial ethics. And he had it on his t plate for, I don't know, maybe about two and a half years and never wrote it. And it was the last piece that was the constraint of our completing the book was this article. And so I saw uh, Mike at a uh, Advocates Africa meeting and just sort of said, hey, is it possible for you to write this chapter on judicial ethics? Because we want to get this book done. And of course, he's got a million things going on. He's like, sure. And then uh, he probably had, me, had a draft to me in like 10 days or something. I don't know. And so then we were able to finish the book. And I mean, that's pretty cool because he was in the middle of being named DPP and all these other things. And uh, I just think that's, that says a lot, you know, that he's willing that about the ability to get stuff done because that's not something that I could have gotten done in that situation. And uh, anyway, so that's a little story about uh, Mike Chibita. Uh, and then we've already heard uh, from Edward uh, Sekabanja Kato, who is with us again. And really what he is all about to me is just the example of how you can just really be sort of a normal advocate, as we say in Uganda, or a normal lawyer, but be an incredible witness and be an incredible agent of change in your society just by practicing law the right way, uh, not by mastering theories or by getting up and browbeating people about anything, just, just getting out there and doing it and living and walking the walk on a daily basis. And it's just a really powerful testimony. And that's why I have him come and speak to our students at Uganda Christian University. Um, I try to get him there regularly. He was actually supposed to be here this week since I knew I was going to be away, I lined him up to come and talk to my, and so when I saw that he was on the panel, I was thinking it was probably going to be difficult for him to speak to my students this week, and, and I, I, it proved prescient at the end of the day, so, but he will come and speak to them again, and it's always a huge inspiration to them, and it's the kind of person he is, if you say, can you come and speak? Yeah, you know, and he does, and so it's really pretty incredible, and then we've heard already from Peter, uh, and even I, being in Uganda, as long as I have, I, I have trouble with Sewa Charanga. Sewa Charanga. Is that pretty good, Peter? Sewa Charanga. But see, the good thing in Uganda, you don't have to call him Mr. Sewa Charanga and whatever. <laughs> you don't have to do that because that's just his name. Like, that's like his name, Peter, in, 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 in Ugandan language. So it's like Chibita isn't really like his last name, now of course, Dr. Chibita is married, they've, so they've become Chibita. They've actually become Chibitas because their ch childrens are Chibitas. Um, but for many U Ugandans, these names aren't last names. They're all just names. And so you could have a brother and sister. They all have different names. Nobody has the same names. And they're just names like Joshua, Mark, Billy, Bob, Tom, you know, or whatever. <laughs> And so we always want to put them in a box and force them to say, this, no, this is your name, you know, this is your last name, this is your surname. And there's, we're like, what? And I'm always taking these students to, uh, to, to the U.S. for different, you know, we, we compete in the Jessup competition and we've done it six years in a row now. And so they have to conform because they have to get a visa and they have to say, no, which of these names is your last name now? And they have to pick. <laughs> Another interesting thing about names you need to know um, when you think about Edward is the name Kato, or we also heard it as, is, as Kato, which is cool. It was just, you know, Kato is a good philosopher name. But in Uganda, they'd say Kato. Every time there's an A, it just goes, ah. 
across the board. It never it never makes the A sound. Just for just so you know, these all the, all the vowels only make one noise, and so then once you know that one noise, you can you can pronounce these names. But Kado means twin. So anytime you see somebody that's Kado or Waswa, you you know that they're a twin. And if they're Kado, you know they got out first. <laughs> a lot last. Sorry, see what I know. Waswa came out first. And if you're Opio, you got out first. Everybody's got twin names. And so usually the the fast one means yeah, it means uh, Waswa means speedy. And I think Kato means something else, right? <laughs> Yes, not speedy. All right, so then we have one proper uh, introduction here. So I get to do one traditional style here for uh, Deputy Ambassador Dixon Aguang. So Dixon, he holds his Bachelor of Law from, and this is another tricky one. If you ever read this word, Macari, or ma it reads Macarari, okay? And so it just kind of gets squeezed into Macari somehow. So uh, we just say McCrary. He's uh, McCrary University in Kampala. And uh, he got an administrative science degree, diplomacy and international relations from Fairleigh Dickinson University, and a specialized diploma in prosecutions and a diploma in law from the Law Development Center in Uganda, and a certificate in leadership and governance from the Leadership Institute in Arlington, Virginia, an advanced certificate in disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration of ex-combatants with broad knowledge of UN integrated disarmament, demobilization, reintegrated standards, integration standards. He's a certified conciliator with proven skills in conflict coaching, mediation, arbitration from the Institute of Christian Conciliation, a division of Peacemaker Ministries. And then he is married and blessed with children. How many children? We're supposed to know how many children. Five children. Okay. He has over 16 years of professional development in national and international leadership. He's been active in the national politics of Uganda, was involved in the 93-94 UN constitution-making process. So we had those that from last time about how to make constitutions. So if you've you had some questions about how to make constitutions and you've saved them from yesterday, I think you, you're fair to uh, ask those questions as well as Dixon because he actually can tell you what it was like because he actually did that um, on in Uganda, so uh, so that's okay. You're open to those questions as well, right, Dixon? Okay, excellent. Um, and he is a student activist, being the pr then president for U Uganda National Student Association. He has promoted candidates for parliamentary and presidential elections. He is uh, a broad in understanding of social, economic, political environments in Uganda and elsewhere in East Africa. Here's a story about how Dixon helped me one time. David Bologna and I were gonna go to uh, Eastern Congo, and uh, we actually did go eventually, but when we were going to go, uh, we contacted Dixon because he knows a lot about security in the area and what's going on. And Dixon said, don't go to Congo right now. And uh, David and I prayed about it, and we said, yeah, we shouldn't go. And we told the people we weren't going, and the other people thought we were a bunch of babies, um, you know. Why aren't you going? You know, we just got to go for it. We said, well, Dixon said we shouldn't go. And then I think as soon as we were supposed to go, there was a, you know, a battle, basically, right where we were going. So he, uh, God blessed us through Dixon for sure uh, in that situation. So he does know what's going on in terms of conflict in, in East Africa. And unfortunately, we have way too much of that. Um, he's a recipient of the Distinguished Service Award uh, Dixon was appointed by uh, President Museveni in 2010 as Deputy Ambassador to Washington, D.C., and between August 2010 and November, the President assigned him Special Presidential Envoy to the United States to work with Counter Lord's Resistance Army and Northern Uganda Peace and Recovery Issues, and he is uh, from Lira. So if you, have, if you are an invisible children buff somehow, or you, you have invisible children questions, good, bad, or indifferent, or you want to know about Coney, He's the man as well. So constitution making, Coney, lots of interesting things that he knows a lot about. Um, he's now working at the Ugandan Embassy, Washington, D.C., as a minister counselor with special forces on LRA and northern Uganda post-conflict reconstruction, uh, reconstruction. And he's doing a lot of exciting stuff with Sam Casey, who is with Inter Advocates International in Lira area. They've started an institute there, an educational institute in their they're training leaders in important fields in northern Uganda, and that's exciting as well. So he's got a lot of really great stuff going on. God is using Dixon in 
powerful and awesome ways. And it's exciting to have him on the panel as well with our others who we already have heard from. So this is an awesome panel. This is why I think, Ernie, you were most excited about this panel of everything else. And really the theme of the panel is, okay, we do a lot of uh, looking at East Africa and saying, oh, we've got all these great models. We've got all these things. We've got the answers to, to, to help you in your situation. And I think we actually do have a lot of really cool ways we can help, and we've seen it. There's a lot of ways we can maybe not help, but there's a lot of ways we can help. But we're going to try to turn the tables here this morning, and we're going to try to uh, open ourselves up to learning something uh, from the East African context and from the cultures and the customs and the things that, uh, that, that are there indigenous to the people in East Africa and how they uh, handle uh, the challenges there. Maybe we can hopefully learn something from our, our brothers who are here. And I did promise that I also had to introduce Dr. Monica Chibita, who is, she's been mentioned before, but I don't think she's been mentioned as Dr. Monica Chibita. And she's my fellow colleague at Uganda Cr Christian University. She heads up the mass communication program. And I think it's really cool that she's here at Regent because in case you haven't noticed, you guys are pretty good at mass communication too over here. So I'm hoping that the partnership with Regent uh, will expand beyond just law. And that uh, I know that uh, uh, Dr. Chibita is fast at work trying to make some other good things happen. And that's just, I mean, isn't that what we've, we've seen from this whole process is this sort of amazing spider web of God and just all these things that come together. And so I think if you want to pray about something else on your prayer list, pray for uh, that relationship with, with Regent and UCU and, and the Mass Comm and that uh, that's something that, they, that we can benefit students on both sides uh, in that field as well. Okay, so you've heard way too much from me. But they said I could do whatever I wanted to do, so I've done that, right? Okay, so I think the first person we're going to hear from is uh, Director Chibita. I believe you're first on my list. So welcome to the podium, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I struggle because Dennis and Brian are both first names. So I forget whether it's Brian Denson or Dennis Bryanson. <laughs> uh, so I, this morning I think you are Dennis, Dennis <laughs> Bryanson. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, very confusing. <coughs> but uh, glad to be here this morning and uh, thank you all for turning up. Uh, it's Saturday morning, sometimes when you're traveling you lose uh, lose track of what day of the week it is, but I think it is Saturday morning. <laughs> In Uganda, it is uh, Saturday evening. <coughs> uh, so since I'm starting, I guess I get to define the terms on my terms. Restorative justice, uh, that's what I found out. Focuses on rehabilitation of offenders, <coughs> reconciliation of offenders with victims and the community and uh, transitional justice, set of judicial and non-judicial measures aimed at redressing legacies of human rights abuse and uh, such measures include prosecutions, truth commissions, reparations. We have uh, one of those set up in Uganda, Institute for Transitional Justice. Uh, Why restorative and transitional justice? Uh, we, we've, of course, the stage has been set for this. And uh, as you know, many of you, that law and justice are not always the same thing. So even as we enforce the law, we always try to ensure that uh, we spice it a bit with the justice. <laughs> Uh, so I, I think that's why uh, the criminal justice system tries to find different uh, ways, plea bargaining, uh, victims' rights, and so on. Because uh, hard criminal law as it is, you know, is just about one thing. We are trying the criminal, sentence them, <coughs> and we forget about it. But uh, you know, that doesn't always deliver the best uh, results uh, because uh, of many reasons, but one of those is because the victims sometimes are wondering what 
is it that they are getting from the just system? Uh, there are some, uh, the way this resonates, restorative and transitional justice, is because there are some traditional and informal judicial practices. We looked at some yesterday under the mango tree. Uh, and they are necessary because uh, Uganda has gone through some uh, violent history from Amin's time, uh, Idi Amin, when uh, many th there was a lot of extrajudicial killings. Uh, one of the most notable ones was uh, the Archbishop of the Anglican Church was actually murdered, uh, some people say, by Amin himself, uh, the late Janan Loom, and uh, Chief Justice of uh, Uganda, uh, late Benjamin uh, Chiwanuka, he was murdered at the court, actually. So Amin did a lot of things, and uh, rule of law came to a halt. Of course, we had uh, some, some other killings in uh, Obote II regime, that is uh, especially in the Luero Triangle, and then we've had Konye and that kind of thing. So a lot of violent uh, history breakdown of the rule of law. <coughs> uh, when uh, the current government came in in 1986, they introduced something called the local council courts. It was kind of a hybrid between uh, the informal mango tree courts and the formal courts. In other words, uh, they were empowering uh, representatives of the local people to hear some disputes uh, on uh, some local matters, land, marriage, and uh, those kinds of things. Of course, previously there were customary clan courts which decided matters of, of land and, and marriage. In some areas they still exist, informal. Uh, as I was doing this research, I remember the case. There was one case uh, which s said it was a controversial case because I remember my professor of, uh, of uh, family law saying that it was a bad decision. But uh, the decision was that there is no procedure for dissolution of marriages under customary law. You know customary law is one of the laws under which uh, people can marry in Uganda. So I think these two people had married customarily. We are trying to have their marriage dissolved. And uh, the judge in that particular case said uh, under customary law, there was no procedure for dissolving a marriage. Uh, again, it's, it's one of those things, uh, whether right or wrong, uh, we'll look at that. The International Criminal Court comes in to add another layer of courts in uh, this entire mix. Uh, International Criminal Court, you know, has indicted uh, several members of the Lord's Resistance Army, Konyi, and about five of his commanders. But in Uganda, we have uh, a division of the High Court called uh, International Criminal Division. That is what ICD is about. And uh, we have this small... Uh, uh, battles, verbal battles going on between uh, the ICC and the ICD over who has the right uh, to try Konye if ever he's captured. Uh, in fact, some of Konye's commanders have uh, been captured or surrendered. Again, depending on whether they were captured or they surrendered will determine where they are tried. Uh, I don't know if you followed what our president has said about the ICC. He used to be uh, an ardent advocate of the ICC, but lately, because of the Kenyan uh, politicians, he now is very critical of the ICC. Uh, <coughs> and then in this whole mix, there is something called the Amnesty Commission in Uganda. Because of the rebellion, uh, Konya Resistance Army rebellion, uh, government came up with something <coughs> called Amnesty commission where people who wanted to escape from the Lord's Resistance Army could voluntarily surrender and come and get amnesty from the amnesty commission. Now, as I had mentioned earlier, the International Criminal Division is trying people who are captured uh, from this conflict. But there is again a small, uh, small uh, fight between the Amnesty Commission and, uh, and ICD because uh, 
Amnesty Commission says uh, we need to encourage more of these people to come out. And so if you prosecute them, your message will go back and it, they will de discourage those who have not surrendered. So instead of prosecuting them, let's give them amnesty. And they, again, there is a bit of conflict there. Uh, some victims have been involved. You want these people prosecuted? You want them given amnesty? Uh, I think Dixon will talk a bit more about that. I've been drawn into this because uh, as a chief prosecutor, again, I've had uh, to, to, to make a few decisions on this, whether we let Amnesty Commission take the people or whether we prosecute them. Uh, as I say in the next line, Konya and his commanders were indicted by the ICC and the International Criminal Division wants to try them and the Amnesty Commission wants to grant them amnesty. <coughs> there, there is always, uh, every time somebody is captured or surrenders, you know, there is a bit of activity on uh, what, uh, of course, once in a while, the victims are asked. And uh, again, who are the victims of this conflict? You could almost say the entire Northern region are, conf are victims of this conflict. Who do you ask and so on? It, it is a bit of a complex uh, mix of things there. Limitations. <coughs> uh, criminal law by its nature, if an offense is committed, uh, punishment. And uh, one of the reasons we punish people is because we want to deter uh, other people from doing the same, you know. Um, Peter there told you about child sacrifice, and my own view at now is uh, we need to get hard on these witch doctors because once we prosecute successfully about uh, three of them, I think the others will realize this is bad business. So that, that is what criminal law is about. You have to punish people and then they realize uh, this is not profitable business and uh, that discourages it. Uh, restorative justice, again, from purely prosecutor's point of view, seems to be cuddling, uh, cuddling criminals. Uh, it's criminal centric and that is part of its limitation, and that's why many practitioners, judges, don't even want to indulge in it, because we went to law school to study that uh, crime must be punished, and uh, we, we have a lot of laws to follow. And also the other thing is uh, the criminal justice system, of course, most times ignores uh, victims' rights. Uh, I will not say anything more about that last uh, thing, because uh, uh, I have said it, and uh, and, uh, and 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 so on. But the, the, uh, something about the standard of proof. I was trying a case of uh, defilement. Uh, this is a, a father who defiled his own daughter. So one of the key witnesses was the mother, the wife. Uh, you know, in these uh, sexual offences, uh, you, you have to say everything because then. Uh, that, that is how. So now this mother could not uh, just bring herself to say, uh, and they have to say it in vernacular, then it is translated in English, but the mother could not uh, bring herself to say that uh, her husband had sex with, uh, with, uh, with the daughter. So we spent about 30 minutes trying to, to make her say this, and uh, she was saying he slept on her, he slept with her, and so on. And uh, of course, in order to discharge this burden, she had to say, my husband had sex with our daughter. But I think culturally, it, it was very, very difficult. And eventually, she did not say it. And. Uh, of course, the defense lawyer was trying to capitalize on that uh, to say that uh, we don't know what happened because the witness could not say what happened and, uh, and so on. Uh, but of course, uh, again, that goes to the burden, you know, the burden that is placed on witnesses in these kinds of, of cases. Uh, restorative justice in East Africa, it tries to emphasize the issue of compensation because a young girl is, uh, is defiled, and you sentence the perpetrator to whatever, life in prison. So what happens to the young girl? What, what has she got out of the just system? Okay, somebody's in jail. How about her? 
basically that is the question. She is a victim. The state has convicted somebody and sentenced. But uh, you say the person who did this to you in return, wh what did you get out of it? So restorative justice, uh, in some cultures, they will give a high goat or something to know that, uh, and whether that is worth it or something. But uh, I, I think the emphasis was that the victim should have something to show that uh, when this happened to me, this is what I got out of it. Uh, in some cases, uh, the families insist that uh, the defiler must marry. Again, sometimes that is the <laughs> worst abuse. Uh, but, but because in some communities, once there has been defilement or rape, then uh, the future of such a victim is spoiled for marriage purposes and that kind of thing. Uh, so th there are all kinds of conversation that can take place. Uh, of course, because, uh, again, the, the, the culture is such that it is rural and it is agricultural, a lot of uh, premium is put on, uh, on livestock. It's like the only thing that can, uh, can, uh, can be exchanged in a... In cases of murder and robbery and theft, of course, robbery and theft, there is atonement, there is return, this and the other. But, but we've had some cases of murder where people wanted to do restorative justice, uh, giving uh, seven cows and uh, that kind of thing. Just to say that uh, it's not recognized by the criminal justice system. Uh, people can do it informally, sometimes uh, so the matter doesn't come to court, but once uh, we learn about it, we definitely will intervene. The hindrances, a case backlog, how is it a hindrance is uh, when a judge goes to a place, <laughs> he has his 40 cases to go through, he doesn't want to hear any destruction about restorative justice. He wants to apply the law as it is in the books and get on with the matter. Uh, doesn't want any distractions and the prosecutor the same. And because there are so many cases, you don't want to get into the niceties of this and so on. Uh, of course, the other hindrance is lack of exposure and commitment to holistic justice system. Again, it takes a lot of time and energy and thinking outside the box. Yeah, the box is a penal code act. It prescribes. And uh, uh, tyranny of the criminal justice system, again, it just bang, bang. Murder, the sentence is this, you move on. Uh, of course, the other hindrance and setback is the restorative justice. Th there is no codification. So you don't know exactly that yeah, when this happens, you do this and all. And uh, the people who are operating the formal criminal justice system want uh, things uh, which are codified. Penal code prescribes uh, an offense and there is a sentence and you move on. Now this restorative justice is uh, not codified, so it depends on the uh, goodwill of a uh, lot of people. Uh, in conclusion, there is a place, there is a place for, for, for this, and that's why a lot of people try to settle criminal cases without either bring them to court or, because there is a place. People sometimes feel, uh, I mean, the case, uh, the example I gave yesterday of uh, these uh, witnesses who recorded police statements, they met with my prosecutor the day before, then they got caught the next day and they disown everything that had been discussed. It just shows for some reason they were not ready to proceed with the case. So there is still a room for, for restorative justice, people to discuss. <coughs> But uh, people need to be sensitized that the alternative exists and uh, maybe if they agree on it, it is okay. Uh, the benefits of restorative justice society, I think, need to be highlighted. But uh, <coughs> you can be sure it will not be the DPP who will be highlighting this because, again, my task is well spelled out uh, and so on. So we would have to need uh, to get a separate... Uh, person or department within my office to, to highlight this and promote it. Otherwise, the way things are right now, 
there is so much on my plate and uh, I, uh, my conviction rate and the figures and all are dependent on, uh, <laughs> on how many people I convict uh, out of the 130,000, uh, yeah. Uh, of course, um, we could codify. Once there is a codification, then it would help that in this case, if the people agree on this, it has happened in this case and all. Um, the judiciary in Uganda has come up with sentencing guidelines now. Uh, they just became effective uh, recently, less than a year. And in these sentencing guidelines, they have put a provision for victim impact statement, uh, community impact statement. I think this in a way can help the issue of restorative justice. Because previously, as a judge, when you are sentencing, here I go on my pet project again of the law being tilted in favor of the accused. When uh, it is in mitigation, a judge, because the accused person is there, you can hear him say something in mitigation. The victim actually doesn't have to be there. Many times the victim is not there when you're sentencing. So you don't know what they think about the sentence and so on. But uh, now under the sentencing guidelines, it's a requirement that the judge hears from the victim about the particular thing, which is a very progressive idea. And again, that would, uh, would help in restorative justice. I gave an example one time, another case I was trying where the father had defiled the daughter and the mother was in court as the main witness. And this was my first such case when I was a new judge. And I kept thinking, what does that mother think about? Because uh, I could sentence the husband to life in prison, but now she's with a daughter. So I, I adjourned and I asked for, 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 the, for the mother to be brought to my chambers. I just wanted to know what, what she thought about this whole scenario. And uh, it liberated me when she told me, I've surrendered the gentleman to the just system. Whatever you do with him, uh, I've given you full liberty. A and it helped me to know that, okay, I know what she thinks. She's uh, one of the chief victims in this case. Of course, the other thing, uh, finally, of course, we need to take care of the victims. Uh, again, uh, w we have set up a, a desk in the Directorate of Public Prosecution because, again, I believe the victims are not uh, amply represented in the criminal justice system. We want to hear what it is. And uh, as a way of entrenching plea bargaining, which we mentioned that uh, Pepperdine and all have been helping us with, Plea bargaining will help us bring in, uh, in the victims. I will give one last example as I sit down. Uh, there was a, a young man who drank, uh, who drove, <laughs> drove under the influence of alcohol. He had no driving permit. He ran a police check and went and knocked uh, some people on a border border uh, motorcycle taxi. There were three people, one died uh, instantly. She was a university student. <coughs> this is one of the cases I, I jumped into when I took office. Uh, the auntie of the girl who died was a judicial officer, magistrate, and uh, she was insisting because she's enlightened and she, she was saying uh, this boy has to be charged with murder because, uh, I mean, no driver's license, under the influence of alcohol, had run a police li uh, check, and so on. Uh, and uh, the prosecutors were saying, no, no, this is uh, a terrible accident, but it's a traffic offense. Um, so I came in, and she came and made her presentations on behalf of the victims. I called my officer who was handling and said, uh, you know, murder will be hard put because how do you infer motive in this case and that kind of thing. So eventually we agreed to charge him with manslaughter. Uh, he was out on bail and uh, the case, again, the difference between my office and uh, office of a judge is office of a judge, you retreat and uh, write your judgment in peace and quiet. Now director of public, <laughs> emphasis on public, the public is uh, in your office, everybody making representations about why you should prosecute, why you should not prosecute. Anyway, uh, a few weeks ago, the young man himself came to my office 
and told me that uh, he was sorry and uh, he was ready to plead guilty as long as we could guarantee that he didn't do time in jail. Uh, he had done two months on remand and, and, and so on. So I called the judicial officer, the auntie of the girl, and, and the boy added in for good measure that he had seen the mother of the, ch of the, the, the deceased girl and she had forgiven him and so on and so on. So I called in the lady, the, the, the magistrate, and I told her the, this gentleman is willing to plead guilty. What can we, I, I mean, we are not obliged really to engage the victim to that event. We can inform them, but uh, this was in a way a colleague and I could understand losing a university old daughter. So we, we talked anyway, long story short, uh, uh, <coughs> We said we would uh, make our presentations and leave it up to the, to the sentencing magistrate to see whether they gave the boy uh, time or not. So uh, the boy went, pleaded guilty we, 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 to, to the offense. And uh, my office asked for a stiff penalty. And uh, the lady magistrate again spoke on behalf of the victim's family and uh, also asked for a stiff penalty and uh, the boy was put in for one night because he was convicted on his own plea but now the magistrate needed a, a day to, to write uh, the sentence and uh, eventually he was sentenced but not to a jail term he was fined uh, eight million is how much in dollars <laughs> about three thousand dollars a fine uh, from my point of view this is a case which could have taken us uh, two years to try and prove and so on. We resolved it in two days. I told the lady that, uh, you know, you have a conviction. You can go to civil court and uh, ask for compensation and so on. But uh, she, she was, it was kind of a win-win situation, restorative and so on. Th this is one. So we think through plea bargaining will be able to accomplish and try to bridge the gap between restorative and the formal justice. Thank you very much. So th there's a lot going on there. If you, you know, as you're as you're trying to process it all, I think it's good to, to you know take a step back and think. You know, what is restorative justice? Yeah, it's about. It sounds simple enough. Restoring um, in in northern Uganda, where Dixon's from, uh, the restorative justice is clearly part of a. It's a process. It's not just a matter of giving something to someone there's that piece but there's also the aspect of ritual that is gone that that both sides go through to restore through ritual and uh, i think one thing that dixon brings to the table that's very interesting is he's he's from uh, he has experience in northern uganda and all the conflict that's gone on there and is trained and, and he can tell you about what's what they've done to try to restore these relationships but he also has the Christian perspective because he's done the, the peacemaker training. And so he's really got some interesting insight on, you know, these two restorative reconciliation traditions and how they can operate on the ground in a situation where horrible things have been done by people that live very close to each other and have to live with each other. So uh, he's going to have a, I think he has a very interesting perspective on this on this principle of restorative justice. So let's welcome Dixon to the stand. Good morning. Thank you so much, Brian, for the very kind introduction you gave. And I'd like to thank um, my brother, Justice Mike, and colleagues for all the efforts you have put in since yesterday. Um, this is a very interesting uh, day. The last day is always a day when people are looking forward to going home. <laughs> but I hope that we are going to have the most of these remaining hours. Um, oh, let me see how this thing works. All right. When I stand here, I stand on behalf of my country, Uganda. And uh, we are so lucky that in Uganda we recognize God. 
and this is a very interesting panel that is condensing a lot of things together. It's a panel that is condensing the law, diplomacy, and the gospel. When you mix all this together, I don't know what you come up with. And uh, I, put, I find myself condensed in the middle of all this. A person who has gone through the criminal justice system as a police officer, as a public prosecutor, as a diplomat, as a Christian conciliator, and also as a traditional peacemaker. So I find myself actually condensed um, in sharing with you these few minutes. But I hope God is going to help us get the best from this time. Before I proceed, I want to remind you yesterday when uh, um, they talked about a girl called Brenda. You saw a picture of a girl who was full of dirt and rags a few years ago. But today, this is the Brenda we were talking about. That is the power of the gospel. <laughs> Brenda is a grown-up girl now. She is at school enjoying education in a very prestigious uh, school. She is also enjoying relationship with my family. She has sisters and brothers. Uh, my big girl there is uh, ready for college. And the two, um, the two of them, the girl Faith on this side is in the same class with uh, Brenda. But she went ahead of Brenda because Brenda had to start a little later. So she is now going to high school at Stella Maris College while Brenda remains at uh, Global Junior, a very good school in Mukono. In the middle also is one of the girls that we adopted. She's almost a twin brother to my, a twin sister to my little David. Well, that's what the gospel can do. And yesterday I was struck like lightning when I saw the picture and reminded of Brenda when we picked her from the IDP, the Internet Displaced People's Camp from Golo. Okay, now let's get going. The presentation today, and uh, before I proceed, I want to just again re-echo that uh, when God prompts you to doing something good, just do it. <laughs> I think uh, Jim and John will remember that David was prompted to do something good, and he just did it. And that is the result we can see. There are many things that you can do that will have a lasting impact in one person's life, in a community's life, in a nation's life, and impact the whole globe. My presentation today um, explains reconciliation and restorative justice, the role of lawyers in uh, reforming the law, the rule of law, and how the church can address the development of justice in places of violence. Actually, the second one also includes the role of lawyers and diplomats. Um, my brother Mike is in a very difficult place. Uh, the DPP, where I had the privilege of working for 10 years, you are mandated to actually achieve prosecution. I mean, achieve as many convictions as possible. We are geared towards prosecuting the offenders and ensuring that we convict them. But um, it's interesting that uh, we also have provisions that deals with uh, reconciliation in our legal provisions. And I'm going to talk about that in a bit. Over the last two days, we have heard and from various enlightened, well-experienced and distinguished speakers, emphasis on the rule of law. As we come to the end of this symposium today, we can all agree that every one of us shares the belief that the rule of law is a foundation of equitable state relations and the basis upon which just and fair societies are built. A lot has been discussed by various speakers, and I'm pleased to add just a little bit of my thoughts to what has already been discussed. Reconciliations and restorative justice is a Simple term is a people focus 
approach to justice with a spirit of promoting social bond and peace for the progressing peoples and communities. In general terms, restorative justice refers to an alternative model for facing crime, which is based on the social importance of reconciliation between parties, victims, and perpetrators. It advocates for a criminal law model that pays attention to the victim and the harm he or she has suffered as a result of the crime. The Constitution of the Republic of Uganda is a people-focused constitution. We have talked about this constitution, Brian has mentioned a little bit about it, in the promulgation of this constitution. We took care of the history of the people of Uganda, where we have come from as a people, the wounds deeply rooted in us as a people. And then we came up with a constitution that is actually people-focused. Our constitution is, puts the people, makes the people supreme. It focuses on the supremacy of the people, not the law and not the state. It is not the state which is supreme. <laughs> it's not the law that is supreme. It is the people who are supreme. That's why um, it was promulgated with a people-focused approach to justice under Article 126.1. There's a very clear provision there that judicial power is derived from the people and shall be exercised by the courts established under this constitution in the name of the people and in conformity with the law and values, norms, and aspirations of the people of Uganda. In the same spirit, section 160, I mean, clause 2D of this constitution makes even a very interesting provision. It provides for the role of the courts to promote reconciliation between parties to disputes of both criminal and civil nature. Justice Mike was talking about it, and I don't think he should apologize for what he did in communicating with the victims and the relatives of the big victims as he was going through the case of accident, this is entrenched within the legal provision. It is the role of the courts to promote reconciliation as we go through the cases. It doesn't mean that the accused has to go unpunished, but in some cases, the accused actually walks out forgiven and pardoned by the victims. That's why under Section 160 of the Magistrates' Court Act, it provides that in criminal cases, a magistrate's court may promote reconciliation and encourage a facilitation, encourage and facilitate the settlement in an amicable way of proceedings, especially for assault or for any other offense of a personal nature personal and private nature, not amounting to a felony and not aggravated in degree in terms of payment of compensation or other forms of approve, other terms approved by the courts, and may thereupon order the proceeding to be stayed. While working in the courts, I was involved in lots of these kind of settlements uh, where you find people coming, those who are supposed to be your witnesses, and they come to your office as a prosecutor and said, we have already looked through this case in the village. We have sat down. We saw that there is no need for us to keep coming to court. We have agreed to forgive the offender. He has accepted to put off all the bills that was involved in the treating of the victim. And we don't think that we should carry on with the case. We want to withdraw this case. And we would just facilitate the reconciliation and uh, the withdrawal of the case in a legally uh, provide, provided manner. According to these visions, the main objectives of the state's response to crime should be the satisfaction of the victim's needs and the reestablishment of social peace, 
In that way, more than punish, punishing the offender, criminal law seeks the reconciliation and recognition of the victim's suffering, reparation of her harm, and restoration of her dignity. As for the perpetrator, EROC is reintegrated and reincorporated into the society, a society that is prepared to receive him in order to reestablish social bond and a peaceful cohesion within the community. From the restorative perspective, retribution, retributive punishment is seen as insufficient for reestablishing a peaceful social coexistence for it does not give primary importance to the victim's suffering and needs, nor does, that, does it allow for the adequate re reincorporation of the delinquent in the community. In contrast, the retributive paradigm is only concerned with the future instead of the past. In so doing, it does not focus on evaluating the guilt of the sufferer and the offender, but promotes all those mechanisms capable of making him conscious of the harm he caused, admitting his responsibility, and carrying, trying to repair the harm. The practice of reconciliation and retributive justice, restorative justice, is deeply rooted in the culture of our people back home in Uganda. To the extent that we believe that no crime, no offense, is unforgivable. We believe that no offense is irreconcilable, including capital offenses. <laughs> this is very interesting. When Brian talked about northern Uganda, where I come from, this is the case. Yesterday when um, Brother Ed Edward was uh, presenting, I sympathized with him a little bit. I'm part of this UCLF. I know that we failed in the north because cases were not actually being prosecuted well. We are lawyers in the way that uh, our ordinary lawyer would want to see case go to the conclusion. But we have saturated this region with the teachings, both general legal teachings and also principles of reconciliation. And they know that the best way to go is to go through conciliative settlement of, uh, of disputes. In that spirit, many of the offenses, many of the cases that goes to court eventually finds its way um, through conciliation. Actually, the term mango tree settlement came from us. <laughs> I think it came, uh, was found on the website of Advocates International and many people started using it. It came when we tried to settle a case which had lasted for over 12 years, a land dispute between a school and a community. And it was broiling up, it was going to be a big, big blast was going to be bloody. But as peace and reconciliation ministries in Africa, we gathered the administration of the school together and the neighbors and everybody involved. And we sat under a mango tree. We went through the case from morning to evening. We left the mango tree in the middle of the, sun, the day, the hot sunshine, walked through the boundaries. We came back. We listened to witnesses. Those who have been chairman management committees years ago, who understand the boundaries, who understand what things, how things have been going, at the end of the day, we were able to resolve the dispute. And on that day, I had uh, um, one of the vice president of Peacemaker Ministries was visiting with us, and he sat with us. He was able to tolerate how we walk through cases. And he went back and made this story about the mango tree justice. We brought reconciliation between all parties who are involved in this dispute. We derive creative solution of resolving these boundary disputes. All, um, all boys of the school came up who were also around and said, we are going to pay for alternative land somewhere else to resettle some other people who are you know, part of the conflict. And at the end of the day, the matter was resolved. We also handled a conflict that was very nasty that involved the death of four people, where a UPDF, then that was an NRA a soldier, went back home to northern Uganda. Of course, in northern Uganda, we were in a conflict situation. So when a soldier is coming home, he tries to have some weapons with him, so that in case of anything, he can defend himself. 
when he came with his uh, weapons, he had grenades. And one day he went to drink. He had a grenade inside his, um, his clothes. But after taking a few drinks, he realized that he did not have the money to pay for the, for the drink. But the money was at home. He left it in his, his other, another clothes. Then he told a lady who was selling the beer. He said, I realized that I left the money in my other clothes at home. Can I run home and come back and pay you? The woman said, no, you must pay me now. I need my money. You soldiers who come home, you, you sometimes grab people's things by force. She did not believe that he could go and bring back the money. He said, no, I'm telling you the truth. My home is not far away from me, and you know me, and they were from the same village. They happen actually to be my relatives. Both of them, both parties. The boy, I call him a boy because he was younger, although he was adult already, he decided to start walking. The lady ran after him and grabbed his waist and started pulling him, I want my money, I want my money. He said, please, don't touch me. I have a weapon inside. The lady thought he was just joking. Other people came and started pulling her. He said, yes, he has a grenade, please, leave him. In the middle of the struggle, the grenade blasted and four people died on the spot. The father of the boy, who was not there, in our community, where such a situation happens, the relatives of the victim pursues the relatives of the offender, even where the offender is also dead. And that is exactly what happened. They ran after the family of the offender, took away whatever they could take, goats, cows, chickens, food from the granary. These people ran away for their lives and the matter eventually, there was no person specifically who could be taken to court in this particular case. But the community had remained hurt by the offense. The relatives of the different parties involved. These people went to a different village where they stayed for seven years. They could not come back to this village, the family of the offender, who has also died and was later buried. And eventually somebody advised him, said, you need to go to court because you need to go home. He went to court and they, they had to come and recover their land. Their land was taken away by the families of the different victims here. He wanted to get back to their land. It was very difficult. They were suffering in a foreign place. These people were later on arrested. A number of people were arrested who were having the land of these people. And um, when the case remained in court, we were alerted that we should come in as peace and reconciliation ministers in Africa. We started counseling the different parties involved. We said, these people were actually innocent according to the law. <laughs> you took their land for nothing. The truth is, they are innocent. They are not party to any crime. This is a position of the law. We are all, you are all at a loss in terms of the death that occurred. There's no particular person directly responsible for this incident. And you are going to lose this case. You are going to, you have been in prison, you have come out, you have been remanded a number of times, you are working every day, you are not going to win this case. So we sat down under the mango tree several days and we came up with a con, um, an arbitration, went through arbitration, left mediation stage, went to arbitration stage, we handled it, but the case in court was still there. And then at the end of the day, we came up with a reasoned arbitration decision. We came up with an agreement which eventually acted actually as a um, you know, consent judgment. We went to court. Part of the agreement was being signed on the bonnet of the car. And eventually, the court had the case withdrawn. The parties reconciled. They migrated back from the village where they had gone into the community. Today they are living together. That is the power of the mango tree settlement. Um, there are other things um, that I would talk about um, in this aspect where we believe there is no offense that is irreconcilable.
There is no dispute that is irreconcilable. We understand the provisions of the law. Now, we have a culture called Matoput and Kayuchuk, which is in the, within the spirit of the Ombutu of South Africa. This culture and tradition is only found within my tribe and in the tribe of the Chole people. Kayuchuk is from my Lango tribe, and Matoput is in the Acholi tribe. This is a traditional ritual of reconciliation that happens whenever a conflict involves death caused by a member of the community. We have what we call clan systems. I belong to a clan. John may belong to another clan. God forbid, if I happen to kill John, the family and the clan of John will run after my family. Even where I've already been arrested and remanded and actually going through mentions of my case which has not yet come to hearing. And I have my attorney, or well, I still don't have an attorney. I will be in prison, but my family will be on the run. My father will not be able to settle in the village. My brothers will not be able to settle in the village. They will be on the run because the community, the family of John will be running after my family to revenge. But we have chiefs and kings whom John had the privilege of going along with me to train them the principles of peacemaking, the principles of mediation, the principle of arbitration, how to go through negotiation of this kind of difficult disputes. We have trained them all through the process of peacemaking. Now, these chiefs, in addition to the cultural practices that they used to have, we have given them more weapons, the, the knowledge that we have used to train them. Based actually on Christian principles, they would come together. The in charge of conflict that, 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 that ensured death, that led to death, the chiefs responsible for those kind of offenses and responsible for mediating. He would walk, said, even if they kill me, I am the chief. So he'll walk to that village and he will mention that I come in peace. I come in peace. I am the chief of revenge from my clan in charge of this kind of situation that has befallen our community. Then they will also receive a chief from that side. They will sit down and say, we want peace. We want to discuss the issue and resolve it. It will be difficult. We will actually be working also with a spear. But the spear will not be used because he will go in the name of peace. The two will start negotiation and there will be a community meeting. Again, sometimes on the mango tree or at the home of one of the chiefs. In most cases, they look for common ground. Then they go through discussions and they say, what are we going to do? The family of the victim says, it's normal. The law is clear. It's not written law, but cultural norms that are, has existed for years. If you kill my son, you pay us seven cows. That's the position. If you have the cows, pay us. Quickly, they said, if that is the case, we are going to bring the cows. Not only the family of the victim, but the entire clan will contribute for the cows. They will bring the seven cows and give to the family of the victim. And another, other two cows, bulls,
makes that decision except him. It is within his own discretion to decide that he's going to withdraw the case against the offender. And he will not give reasons when he's writing to the courts about the withdrawal of that. He will not say it because the community has reconciled. He will just say it, the director of public prosecution has decided to drop charges against so and so. Once that letter arrives in the court, the offender on that day when he came from when he will have come for mention or whatever, he will walk away and he will go back to a reconciled community. He has murdered, he has blood in his hands, he has not been sentenced, he walks away and he will live in the same community. Will again drink together with the people whom he killed his relatives. And that will be it. That is how deep it is from our cultural perspective. We believe there is no crime which is unforgivable. That is the situation where we find the core yellow case coming up. The people who are actually um, agitating for the amnesty, from saying we need him forgiven and come home. Interestingly, when Core Yellow was first arrested, Thomas Core Yellow, at that time I was still in Gulu. I was the first prosecutor to attend to the hearing of his case and develop different charges that eventually were are being used to prosecute him. What happened is that many of the people are from his clan, not necessarily his relatives, but the people from the region believe that whatever offense he has committed, he can still be forgiven. And when he comes home, we shall perform these rituals and he will be fine. If the rituals are not done, they believe that some homens will follow you, something bad will happen to you. We do not only believe in the punishment through imprisonment or something. If you kill somebody and your clan or community doesn't go through this process of reconciliation, you have a disturbed life. Even if the court drops your case due to lack of witnesses or evidence, you may come back acquitted, but you will not have peace. You have disturbed life. That's what they believe. And it is most cases it happens until the community agrees to, to receive you in a good way. That is the most powerful uh, tradition that we have in northern Uganda. And it is existing and works. It is important to understand the notion of reconciliation that underlies restorative justice generally implies an absolute agreement among all social actors, including the victims and perpetrators, regarding the need and the utility of forgiveness, pardon, and the value of the reestablishment of a social tie and harmony. It must be noted that the notion of reconciliation and restorative justice analyze the fact that we are created for reconciliation. Since God created us to need re relationships, he has also provided instruments in his word to help us make our relationships work and also grow strong. You know, this is a deeper understanding that goes beyond the legal paradigm of this world. The understanding of God's creation and God's grace. The reason why God created man at the Garden of Eden was so that he may relate with man. And then he created Eve so that man may have relationship. He created us for relationship, that we may live together in harmonious relationship. When man's sin and relationship broke, man was chased away from the garden and man was divided from God. Because relationship is so critical to God, very important to God, God again in Christ Jesus decided to give his own life to come down and redeem the relationship. And he died on the cross so that we may be reconciled to him and reconciled to one another. So the entire, the understanding of this principle to me is based on how God value relationship. And to God, just like in my tribe, no offense is irreconcilable. Even the offense triable by the ICC. War crimes, whatever. That's why transitional justice comes in. 
That's why the Gachacha court had to work. The community in Rwanda had to use Gachacha community coming together to decide on the fate of the inmates who had taken part in genocide. Many of them testified, they told the truth, and they were given lesser sentence, and they walked out. In the 1996, 97, and again um, in the early 2000s, I did a lot of discussion with prisoners inside the Rwandan prison. I had a lot of testimony about how, you know, listening to the offender, talking with the, 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 the victim, and eventually, I, I cannot do much for you. All I can do for you when I'm released, I will build for you a house. This, this is one, I, I, remember, I remember this because I did some recordings, where the victim, a woman whose husband was killed, was testifying on how, in case he's released, he's released he will come and help this woman build a house for her and explain how the woman survived. Said, you survived from us. We were, act we were just like dogs. We were so brutal. We were killing people and we were mad. We were behaving like dogs. You survive after we kill your husband. We tied um, heavy stone on his leg and we throw him in the waters. But because you were pregnant, we could not kill you because we thought it was going to be a bad omen to us. And that's how you survived. And he started crying and both of them started crying. Later on, they get reconciled. Well, what are our roles as lawyers and I mean, and diplomats? in reforming the rule of law. Both lawyers and diplomats understand that the rule of law is fundamental for building equitable state relations and the basis upon which just and fair societies are built. We are daily engaged and should be committed to the efforts of reforming the rule of law in the global community of nations as a basis for our calling and practice. As a general principle, we should see our legal and diplomatic positions as both a calling and a God-given opportunity. You know, um, this is a, a very interesting point. I try now to mix the law lawyer together with the diplomat because I find myself in the middle of this. We all have similar responsibilities. Both lawyers and diplomats are very enlightened people. The lawyer knows the law. The lawyer knows the direction a country should take to be considered a country working or governed within the principles of the rule of law. Where the leadership has deviated from the principles of the rule of law, lawyers understand. Diplomats they are internationally exposed, and they know what is good and right. They are exposed to information. They have opportunities of meeting leaders, including leaders of their own countries. They are respected and accepted within countries of their postings. Especially in third world countries, we have seen diplomats engaged in criticizing government and bringing government to account when they start abusing the rights of their people and deviating from the fundamental principles of the rule of law. It is important that as we practice law, we should know that we have a calling, a God's calling, to be agents of transformation, including the transformation and reformation of the rule of law within our communities and in countries where God takes us. As lawyers, many times you, have, you end up taking up a case or deciding to sue a, 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 a sovereign nation for abuse of human rights, for things not being done, things that are not consistent with fundamental rights and principles, unconstitutional ways of behaviors within a country being perpetrated by a state. You decide to take a country to court not because you expect payment, but because you're looking at social change. You're looking at the benefit that will accrue to the members of your community, to people in your country, 
who are going to benefit from the change that will, will come up in case you win the case and bring legal transformation. You, we have to take ourselves as people who are privileged and are people who have the opportunity to serve our people, to serve the citizens of the world with our profession, with our knowledge and skills. As a lawyer, when people walk to your law firm, especially as a Christian lawyer, you cease to see them as money opportunity. You see them now as another opportunity to bring a smile on the face of somebody in the middle of a conflict. And your satisfaction, just like the satisfaction of my brother Edward, will not be in the driving of that luxurious Mercedes in the city where you're practicing law. Your satisfaction will be seeing people walk out of court or come out of a dispute celebrating how you have helped them walk through the conflict and come out praising God because you were there. Your satisfaction is going to be in seeing God glorified in your work. At the end of your case, is God pleased with what you have just done? Or you have been so much taken away and ended up grabbing money in corrupt ways and corrupted justice? You are full of shame. You are haunted in the quiet of your house. You are haunted even when you are driving your luxurious car because you know somebody is suffering. The community is not changed because you have corrupted justice. That's where we find our brother Mike now. He is placed at a position where his decision is critical. But he has the opportunity to glorify God from that office. So our opportunity is to serve seeing clients who walk into our offices as God-given opportunity to make a difference. Opportunity to serve with integrity and setting examples for others. Diplomats should be good listeners and correct conveyors of information. The best diplomat I've come to learn is the one who listens very well, who takes his time to listen. While I'm in the United States, I'm very keen to hear what they're talking about my country. When I get a chance to meet my president, as I did a few weeks ago, I know what to tell him. And I should be able to tell him the truth. Because my words will guide him. What I'm telling him is not from the public domain, but it's between me and him. And I'm the only person with that opportunity. Nobody else has that chance to meet him and tell him, what others are saying. Others may fear to tell him. And if he listens to you and he takes precautions and change, that's your satisfaction. So many times people fear to tell the truth. People don't care. They take the positions as opportunity to get rich, opportunity to make names, but we need to know this is a God-given opportunity for us to bring glory to himself. Ladies and gentlemen, senior diplomats of the United Nations General Assembly by declaration A67L1 of 24 September 2012 reaffirm that human rights, the rule of law, and democracy are interlinked and mutually reinforcing and, reaff um, and that they belong to the universal and invisible core values and principles of the United Nations. The rule of law applied equally to all states and international organizations, including the United Nations. All persons, institutions, and entities are accountable to just, fair, and equitable laws and entitled to equal protection before the law without discrimination. It is therefore the role of both diplomats and lawyers to dedicate themselves to supporting efforts that uphold the sovereign equality of all states, that promotes respect for the territorial integrity and political independence of states, defend states from threats or use of force in a manner in consistent with the United Nations Charter, and in upholding the peaceful resolution of disputes, 
in conforming, conformity with the principles of justice and international laws, given the strong interrelationship between the rule of law and development, advancing the rule of law by both lawyers and diplomats at the national and international levels is essential for sustained and inclusive economic growth. Both lawyers and diplomats have the duty of promoting the principles of good governance, ensuring that states are committed to the effective, just, and non-discriminatory delivery of public services, such as criminal, civil, and administrative justice, commercial dispute settlements, and legal aid. Understanding that the independence of the judiciary and the judicial system, along with their impartiality and integrity, is a prerequisite for upholding the rule of law. The wider body of criminal law developed at the United Nations provide the basis for peaceful resolution of conflicts and the means to ensure there is relapse into there is no relapse into fighting. The universal standard setting power of the General Assembly, the enforcement power of the Security Council, and the judicial power of the National Criminal Court of Justice all provides indispensable tools to deepen the rule of law. Diplomats and lawyers should press and encourage state actors using diplomatic and legal means to commit themselves to the equal application of the law at the national and international levels to uphold its highest standards in their decision making and to accept the jurisdiction of the courts of justice. Last but not least, lawyers as well as diplomats should play key roles in encouraging and facilitating the settlement of international disputes among states using peaceful means. Inter alia, through negotiations, equity, good offices, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, and judicial settlements, or are a peaceful means acceptable within the culture, norms, and practices of the peoples. Ladies and gentlemen, I go to the final parts of my presentation, presentation looking at the role of the church. How can the church address the development of justice in places of violence? First and foremost, the main questions to ask and answer here is, is the church playing its role well as gatekeepers in places of violence? Or rather, she's answering, I am, your am I your brother's keeper? As it was the case with Cain and Abel, fueling conflict rather than being a catalyst to peaceful resolution of conflict. Both Brother Mike and Edward remember one time during our fellowships at Hotel Equatorial when we were taught about the gatekeepers and were given this example about the gatekeeper in China who was uh, bribed and allowed enemies to enter the gate. The walls of China is too strong, but if you don't put a faithful and a trusted person at the gate, then your gates are going to be infiltrated and uh, you're going to lose your people. As Christians, we and as church, we have to act like gatekeepers um, to protect our nations against all kinds of evil practices. And we can only do that if we present ourselves as people of integrity who desist from every temptation to be corrupted. Are the churches in concert with other groups in civil society better placed than our politicians, lawyers, and diplomats to articulate a vision for the future that is gracious and hopeful, sowing seeds of love, justice, mercy, kindness, and peace? The church is critical in the development of justice, peace, and reconciliation in places of violence. First and foremost, by leading with examples. Leading by words, not by deeds. The church should, should be exemplary in the way members conduct themselves and how they respond to conflict. We should be setting examples for the world by following biblical principles of justice as it is rooted in the gospel. Keeping in mind that for the churches to lead the way in fostering justice and reconciliation, it will take leadership from the clergy and public figures, as well as small steps by people at grassroots. You will agree with me that the early church 
was able to influence the society of their times, not by preaching. They gained com converts by their actions, by practice. As the Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 4, I mean chapter 2, verse 40, 42 through 47, the Bible says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to everyone who had need every day. They continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praise the Lord. God, um, the Bible says, the Lord added to them many who are being saved. Ladies and gentlemen, it was not by going out. The one way that the church can use to reform the rule of law and change and transform our communities is by doing the right thing from within the church. It's not just by going to talk out there. It, this is very interesting to me because I got to realize that God himself adds people. God himself will add people who are not interested in going into violence when the church is practicing non-violence. In Rwanda, for instance, it's a shame to realize that the church was involved in fueling genocide. But today, we need to have the body of Christ willing and able to sow a different example, to sow seeds of peace, seeds of justice, I remember the example of one pastor near my village <laughs> who was involved in a dispute with his neighbor, a land dispute. And uh, he came and they were quarreling, interestingly. And he said, uh, man, I'll remove the collar and throw the Bible down and I will handle you man to man. Just that word was enough to make the neighbor migrate to another church. Because I don't believe a clergy with collar on his neck ready to confront a conflict physically and ready to go into violence. Why am I talking about land conflict? This is a major thing that we have been involved in in northern Uganda. Here you find that the, the clergy set a very bad example before a man whom is mandated to shepherd into love, justice, and good works. The neighbor later migrated to another church as he did not see the, the seed of Christ in the clergy and therefore no value, you know, sitting under his teaching for, for the rest of his life. In Uganda, Peace and Reconciliation Ministries in Africa that I had a God-given opportunity to found has been trying to help church establish quasi-judicial system referred to as biblical justice for peace and reconciliation. In trying to help the church in our efforts towards the development of justice in times of conflict and be able to set good examples for the body of Christ. It establishes mechanism of resolving conflict among the body of Christ starting from the courts of first instance to the Supreme Court level by training pastors and elders basic principles of law negotiation, mediation, and arbitration. I happened to take John and uh, a small team recently to meet one of the chairmen who is an elder of, um, in a church who sits in an interdenominational court where they settle this kind of disputes and is working. They are applying the teachings of Jesus based on Matthew chapter 18 verse 15 downwards where they, they encourage people to use a one-on-one -on -one approach and then eventually, they use where the people cannot get reconciled. They use First Corinthians chapter six, verse one through eight, where the Paul himself cautioned the church not to use the earthly, the worldly court in settling their matters, but appoint among themselves men and women who are capable of resolving disputes to act like judges. So the church can be a good influence by starting by practicing examples, um, 
principles of nonviolent settlement of disputes. We have seen this work in northern Uganda, and I believe that if the church everywhere can adopt um, conciliatory settlement of disputes, we can avoid sending federal Christians to court and encourage resolution of conflict among believers from within the body of Christ. Finally, I'll conclude with this famous close quote uh, of Abraham Lincoln that uh, was used by Ken Starr many times when I walked with him teaching communities in northern Uganda the art of peace and reconciliation a few years ago. Discourage litigation, persuade your neighbors to compromise whenever you can. Point out to them how the, normal, the nominal winner is often the real loser in fees and expenses and waste of time. As peacemakers, the lawyer has a superior opportunity of being a good man. There will still be business enough if you think about business. There's plenty in peacemaking. Ladies and gentlemen, God bless you. It has been a privilege and a great honor being with you this weekend. I thank you all. So D Dixon uh, warned us beforehand that he was being compressed. You saw me compressing him. Uh, he had a lot to cover and he did a very a uh, noble job of covering as, uh, a lot of a lot of topics that we gave you there. I th I think uh, just for those of you that are interested in some of the things he was saying, maybe you didn't catch. Uh, there's Gachaka Courts, um, G A C A C A, G A C A C A. Some of you already know, but those are the court systems in uh, Rwanda that handled. Some insane number. John, how many cases did they have? Just something crazy. And they finished. They're done. Thousands and thousands of cases. And I'm reminded of what Michelle was saying last time about her experiences and the importance of resolving things outside of court. And I think that when we talk about lessons from Africa, when we see the efficiency of the Gachaka courts and what it did, and we compare that to what's happened in Arusha with the ICTR, the tribunal in Rwanda, and I think it's still going somehow. And they, I don't know how many cases they've had, but not many. Um, it's humbling when we talk about uh, sort of the efficiency. And I think when we talk about this importance of, the, you know, Ubuntu is that, you know, because you are, I am, basically, this idea that our value as people is communal. And I think it's a different, that's a uh, intensely Christian concept as well as that we have to view ourselves. And I think it's a, something as Westerners that we have a very hard time with. And of course it becomes cliche about the individual approach and these sorts of things. But, you know, I think it's, it's very true. Sometimes cliches are cliches because they're true, you know. And I think that, uh, we have to be aware that we have value through other people. And I think seeing uh, reconciliation and restoration, I think it really brings it out. And you see, it's humbling to see a community that puts a great value on that and those lessons fr from that community. And one other thing to pick up from that one, I think, is the importance of eating with people. You know, and we think about Passover and communion and breaking of bread. I think one thing that's really cool in Uganda is that Christians go and eat with the Muslims during Eid. Maybe you need to make some Muslim friends so you can go eat with them at Eid. Um, but I think eating with people is a really important thing uh, in terms of building community, reconciling these sorts of things. So I encourage you to eat with people, you know, and maybe people that aren't like you eat with them, because um, we see that as this core thing that's happening and, and, and with reconciliation is eating with people is an important thing, going through these experiences together. So thank you so much for that, Dixon. That was really, that was really good. All right, so Edward, you're next up on the, on the block here. So without any further ado, we're going to ask you to take the stand. Thanks.
Yeah, good morning. And I do not um, intend to take very long, um, but I thought I would say three things and then sit down. One is I was asked to speak about the different types of transitional justice. And um, I just want to mention in, in passing that really uh, the are ailments. And most of them have been spoken about here by both Justice Mike and uh, Ambassador Dixon of Guang. And I will raise one question with uh, Ambassador Dixon. And uh, that's really in relation to these um, uh, traditional courts. Because if you look at the elements of uh, transitional justice, I mean, really, which is judicial and non-judicial uh, methods or procedures used to help in, I mean, uh, these extreme cases of um, human rights abuse, you realize that uh, the traditional methods were really not built for that kind of situation, you know? Uh, they were supposed to be in the community uh, disputes. You know. Yes, by accident you may spear or you may have a dispute with your neighbor and end up spearing him uh, to death, but not the scale in which, I mean, you had uh, children turned against their own families uh, in the case of the Northern War with Kony that I mean, these kids were taken, abducted, taken out, and then they came back and attacked, I mean, the communities, I mean, killing their own people. So you, and that's the challenge, I think, that they have found that that is very difficult to apply in, that, in those kind of situations. And uh, even when you go to Kenya and you find after the, the violence of the post-election of 2007, 2008, that even those questions are not yet answered. I think the ICC uh, cases are going to fail. Um, I think they failed from the start. But the questions remain for Kenyans to answer, and they are deep-rooted in both the, the, far, um, the, tra the traditional rivalry between the Kikuyu and the Luo on one side, and when you consider that Uganda at some time extended halfway into Kenya, <laughs> you know, but those are just uh, uh, what, geographical and political boundaries that have been posted by colonial governments, then you start to see where some of these things are coming uh, from. And I think that in the end, um, you look at uh, the laws as you have had them here as we have had them, and then you go and realize that some of them are coming from, I mean, the laws of Moses. And maybe we need to start looking back to where and what is the source of law. My next question, so really, I mean, if you're looking at transitional justice, it is going to comprise of, um, you know, the, the criminal, the, the punishment part of it. Then you have the reparation, how do you compensate? In this case of the Northern Uganda, I mean, with the consultations, the question was, okay, who is going to pay who? Does the government pay us? Because we feel that the government has been attacking our people, you know? So that those, those were the difficulties, I mean, that were there. The truth and reconciliation is part of that. Um, for the part of, I mean, in northern Uganda, you know, that remains a question. How can we ha help the community, I mean, bear its all? It worked in South Africa. I think that uh, we are starting to think that, I mean, in years to come, Uganda is going to need a truth and reconciliation just within itself to, to resolve the challenges that it has had. Good. The other question I was asked to look at was East African values and how they are incorporated into our laws. And I thought I would, I would just share two, 
two cases, having come from the background that he shared, I mean, yesterday, that uh, when you look at uh, the customary laws, that, um, yeah, most of them, I mean, you would consider them repugnant today to natural justice because they probably, they were mainly about men and did not consider women, you know, whether it is in the uh, inheritance of property. So th they, w they wouldn't be constitutional if you took them um, today. Two cases, uh, one, 1992, there was a famous case in Kenya of a lawyer, S.M. Motieno, and uh, this was a lawyer, um, a rich lawyer. He had studied and um, he had married um, a Luo, married a, a Luya, I think, woman, and moved to Nairobi and settled, worked um, rich. He had companies in, in the U.S., he had property in the U.S., and Really, he, he never really went back to his uh, motherland, which is near Lake Victoria. And uh, he died. And the question of where he was he going to be buried? Is he going to be buried in? He wanted to, he made a will. He wanted to be buried in Nairobi. And <laughs> the law, I mean, the, the, the fight was between uh, cultures. Where should a Luo man be buried? <laughs> you know? And that he had to be, so the question, uh, the, 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 the two parties uh, hi hired very, very senior lawyers. And they were also also hired on tribal lines. So, <laughs> so you had one famous lawyer, you had a, 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 a lawyer, lawyer on the side. Remember I told you there were two football teams <laughs> that, that were also formed on, uh, on tribal lines. So, but the court, um, there were injunctions and then counter injunctions. Um, they should have buried the man one day in Nairobi. They didn't. Then the court overturned that. And eventually, I mean, he was buried in uh, his uh, motherland. That's what the court ruled. Uh, but it was in trying to interpret uh, custom at that time. But the real issue was if he was buried, where was the property going? If he was buried according to Luo culture, then the property was going to the Luo. If you were buried in Nairobi, then the property was going to to, to, to the Luya. So really, uh, th that uh, was the fight uh, that w was underlying that. In Uganda recently, we had a, a case where two people wanted to get married. And uh, according to our culture, I cannot marry somebody from the same clan. So in other words, you have a family, and that family uh, belongs to a clan. So that clan is basically is patrilineal. It de is determined by your father. In my now, this is where it becomes complicated because if you're looking at every other um, tribe has their own type of cultural setting. So it is going to be difficult to find any tradition of values really eventually ending up into a national law. Because if you go according to my tribe, for the king, the king's clan is determined by the, ma the, the, the mother. So for the king, <laughs> the clan is matrilineal. But really, that's because the king, in that way, can share all the other clans and belong to all the other clans. But come back to this case, and two people from the same clan uh, wanted to marry, uh, to get married. And uh, the father went to court to object to the marriage. And uh, <laughs> the court agreed with the father that the two could. It was repugnant to the customs of the Baganda people that two people from the same clan could marry. So there, there, there you have it of how, I mean, values have come along the way to be incorporated. I don't know how long that will kind of stand, you know, because um, as I said, that with the modernization and westernization, a lot of culture is 
uh, going out of, of the window. So I think that more than traditional values, I think we, I see that more and more of Western values are what are being inculcated into the laws rather than traditional values. One, because traditional values are so vast. I mean, you have 52, uh, I mean, dialects or tribes in, in Uganda. That's going to be difficult to accommodate any one of them and does not look like the rest. So there we lie, and uh, I await your questions. Thank you. I realized one other thing that I, from, from Dixon's prior talk, uh, he mentioned a, the case of Quiello. You may have wondered what he was talking about. Um, it's because it's a very famous case in Uganda, but maybe not a case that you're following here. At, there have been articles in the New Yorker and other things covering it, so there are some people here that are, might be aware of it. But you can look it up if you can, obviously, you can Google it. I guess some of you might be binging it. I don't know. Everyone just Googles it, I guess. Um, K-W-O-Y-E-L-O, -E but it's a case about uh, amnesty and a uh, very interesting case. It's uh, pending appeal before the Supreme Court. So I think that uh, Mike is going to be very interested to see how this plays out because this way this Amnesty Act works is you can get the guy and he doesn't turn himself over. He just waits to ask for amnesty when he's sitting in jail. And then suddenly, as long as it's political, he gets amnesty. So you could imagine as a prosecutor, you would be very frustrated with these kind of things. And you've got war criminals that have committed terrible things and you get them. And then they sit there in their, in their jail cell and say, oh, amnesty, okay, amnesty, I win. Um, and anyway, so that's K-W-O. Y-E-L-O, uh, and I think those were some great examples, uh, Edward, of, of two cases. And I think for Americans, we're just stunned by that because we think you have the right to marry anybody. I mean, it, it's really an expanded view of incest in a way that is only found really among the Buganda people um, of all the tribes, and there is a court. They weren't trying to get married customarily. They were trying to get married you know, through the other form of marriage, and yet the court said, no, we're going to uphold this essentially customary incest law, clan-wide incest law, not our tradition. So really a fascinating case, especially when we look at our approach to things like that in America, quite a different approach in terms of the enforcement of, of something that's a, really a cultural taboo over the rights to choose who you marry. Um, and I think one other thing you might want to look at when you think about integration is, is what they tried to do in South Africa. It's, of course, your, our job here was to talk about East Africa, um, but in South Africa they actually had Ubuntu as a constitutional provision in their draft constitution. They took it out in their final constitution, yet it does infuse their law in a way. And I think what Dixon was bringing out is the infusion of the principle of reconciliation in the constitution so that under the, uh, this article in the Constitution, you see reconciliation as a principle that in a way can justify um, obviating maybe the, the, the statutory requirements. Uh, so those are other examples. We have structurally in the Constitution ways of, of incorporating African principles. So thank you so much for that, Edward. And now, Peter, your job is to cap us off here as our final panelists in our final session, and then we'll have questions. Wh at what time are we going to run to, Ernie? We're going to run to 12. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you, Brian. Um, I was asked to speak about um, the value of um, East Africans uh, the place in family and community involvement to make changes and uh, to protect one another. And how Champisi Child Care Ministries is using this as a model uh, to produce changes within the law. And 
Secondly, I was asked to talk about the transitional justice importance in communities, and also to discuss how communities can feel legitimized as victims by participating in the justice process, and how lack of justice can lead to mob justice or victim-centered justice. Uh, I will not speak so much about uh, transitional justice because uh, already it has been covered uh, in space of time, so uh, we'll just go straight into uh, the community. When I was thinking about um, family and community, I was reminded of a scripture in First Corinthians 12, 26, which says, and uh, whether one member suffer, all members suffer within it. Oh, one member be honored, all members rejoice with it. Going back to the Ten Commandments, this uh, brings us uh, to the first four of the commandments, which actually deal with man's relationship with God. And then the last uh, six, uh, particularly speaking about man's relationship with man. And uh, this was quite uh, an interesting uh, uh, relationship. But in East Africa, families are slowly but progressively being altered as a result of a process of modernization. Family patterns that were the norm of traditional uh, rural African societies are gradually being altered and substituted by modern values. This transformation has triggered changes in family structures, and this, this has also triggered the distortion of cultural traditional norms and values that are characterized within communities. The family in Uganda is increasingly faced with the challenge of pressure of emanating from competition prevailing between traditional and modern uh, family values. And despite these changes due to the modernization of family, uh, there still remains a prominent nexus in the life of people in East Africa, especially in Uganda. And Uganda, there is a considerable importance attached to the respect of elders and ancestors. Uh, and Uganda also generally uh, is characterized by the prevalence of collective, uh, uh, collectivism as opposed to individualism. And so we look at family, we look at community uh, in dealing with these issues as Ambassador uh, talked about. So the advent of modernity uh, uh, has fostered the pressure of transformation and also taken away some of the values. Although they are still exist, but a lot of it is progressively changing. Now, extended families have been replaced by small families. I come from a family of uh, uh, 12, um, you know, and that is relatively small. In the years back, we had 50, uh, people having 50, and of course, that is polygamy, as well as, you know, having many sisters. That has been also substituted. Uh, this shift is uh, inherent, and therefore, there is a steady increase in the pace of abandonment of traditional practices for modernities, and also abandonment of uh, the family and community values, because people tend now to be closed and uh, not connecting. Uh, the, 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 the construction of houses is also changing, where you see very high um, fences uh, to, to block uh, the connection from communities. However, amidst the changes, there is much need to involve community and families in making changes in the law. And this is how we do it with KCM, or Champisi Child Care Ministries. And uh, with the case, again, of child sacrifice, we have defined our communities, not particularly from the base of the community that was in the years, or that the community that is uh, uh, transforming into modern communities, but we have created our own communities within the communities to make sure that we bring laws uh, changing and also involve everybody within the community and because these are the communities we work with and these are the families we work with. One, interestingly, we have um, created a community of children. The children have a role to play in creating laws within the country. They, their smiles, their innocence, their genuineness must not be neglected in creating laws. Even though we think that they don't have ideas to bring, they actually probably have more ideas to 
to share than probably the busy, tired, and um, stressed professionals. And so we have to include them. And as KCM, we have created that community within how we work. And this is how we have done it. With the case of child sacrifice, we ask them questions. What are their views on the injustice within the communities? Or how do they see child sacrifice or ritual practices within the community? We ask them, should witchcraft be, be prohibited? They will give us answers, even within their innocence. Have they visited a witch doctor and what happened when they went there? Their parents take them. Sometimes they don't understand what is there, but they initiate them when they were still young. And we ask them these questions and they give us the answers because the adults will deny. The children will tell you the truth. Do they think witchcraft works? They will tell us what they think. When and where does it occur? How can they protect themselves as well? Because we are protecting children, but we also want to know how would they want them to protect themselves. And uh, if you are the president of Uganda, what would you do to stop child sacrifice or to stop injustice? We involve them as a community within schools, within our churches, within just engaging with those that have been victimized, and they give us the most genuine answers, and we cooperate them within our research and our recommendations to the people that are engaged in making laws. They express their views, uh, they express them in pictures, and those pictures have spoken to us loads than any words that can tell. We have uh, visited universities where the youth who are energized and are passionate for justice have fresh ideas. Uh, um, you know, ah, we have gone, uh, uh, Brian has opened the door at the Christian University and we've done focus group discussions with the universities to see how they can, how can they, you know, bring the ideas together. And uh, that has also been a community uh, that we have so listed, we have brought the police together and the CID officers, the church leaders and uh, religious leaders, community as well, where we have engaged them in bringing, um, you know, discussing how laws can be changed to fit within the community. Which doctors, especially uh, when we talk about this issue, we realize that uh, they're bad and that's it. You know, they, they practice witchcraft, they kill the children, and that's, and that's, and that's but, but in the reality, you cannot uh, stop, uh, you know, not involve the people that are practicing this. And I want you to look at this video that I'm going to show. And what comes to your mind is, is hard to comprehend, and I'll give you a few um, examples of that. Please play that video. They call him the Miracle Child. A machete was sliced through Alan's head and neck in an attempt to behead him. He was also castrated. The work of witch doctors, attempting child sacrifice. You see this where the cut was. There is a bone missing here. The nine-year-old's mutilated body was found just a mile from his home. Doctors are surprised Alan survived but he will need a lifetime of emotional and physical therapy. The men Alan claims kidnapped him for sacrifice live in this village. They were arrested and released without charge. But members of this community have told us that they continue to take children and sacrifice them. Posing as businessmen, we asked around for a witch doctor who could bring success to our local construction project. We were introduced to this man. Awali. During the first meeting, Awali sacrificed a goat to bring luck to the business. A few days later, we were invited back to his shrine to discuss what he regards as the most powerful spell, child sacrifice. There are two ways of doing this. We can bury the child alive on your construction site, or we cut the child and put their blood in a bottle of spiritual medicine. If it's a male, the whole head is cut off and his genitals. We will dig a hole at your construction site and bury the feet and the hands and put them all together in the hole. 
Alan, do you recognise this man? Alan. And is he one of the men that took you, Alan? <laughs> yes? Yeah. It's too dangerous to confront Awali, so we informed the police of our findings. Official police figures show 38 children have been victims of sacrifice since 2006, a number based solely on conclusive investigations. Charities complain 900 uh, reported cases video, remain outstanding. I wanted to show you how we get involved with these uh, witch doctors. One is this man, I, I was part of the operation, went into the shrine. We wanted to find out the reality because research with this issue is difficult. And you get to involve them to get research, you get to involve them to reach them, you get to involve them to give us the real uh, stuff. Some of the information is difficult. And when you are there as a person seeking for justice, you just want to grab him and take him to police. But that's not how it's going to work. Uh, sometimes we took this to police and there was no follow up on that. At the same time, there is a witch doctor that killed a child seven year old and uh, attempted to kill another. We went, arrested him, took him to police. At the same time, there's a difficult balance of love, of fighting for justice for the child that has died and the family that is seeking justice. There is also a, a balance of making sure that the person you arrest actually, you love them and you don't actually want to say, well, you know, you don't like what they say, but they're people that God can bring transformation to as well. And as we took this man to police, I was locked into the room with him. And I asked him, why did you do this? And the man broke down. You know, he fell into my chest and was crying. And uh, I said, can you tell me the truth? Why did you do this? Well, this is, you know. I was poor, somebody brought this to me, and I, was, you know, I, and I, I did it, I, I did it, I did it. Please pray that my heart changes. He says, you know, and he confessed to it, and he was sentenced to prison, that's it. And as a Christian, we are also called to give them a hug and love them and tell them God, you know, God wants them to change. And we, we, you know, much as that kind of community is difficult to reach, but you know, they have so much information for us to be able to bring justice and make laws because they know. One of the witch doctors that, we, that was transformed when we went to start a church in Champisi is one of the pastors in the church, six years later, completely transformed. This man uh, who is teaching the tricks that witch doctors use was a witch doctor right now is changing lives uh, and teaching people into the communities. Uh, I had another witch doctor uh, a, a man, is a Muslim man who killed his own son and the mother comes to me crying and he points at me and says, like, it's you who has arrested my son, a 23 year old man who killed his own daughter. And I understand the pain of a mother because she's in deep pain for her son. The son has killed. But I also see this pain of a mother who has lost a child. He's crying, that man should be arrested. And that balance a community needs to be conformed together. And this whole issue of child sacrifice breaks the family value, breaks the community. And the last thing you want to see, a family broken, a community broken, and you're fighting for justice. You're fighting for restoration of those that have survived. You're fighting to, you know, to make sure that there is no retaliation within the community. And so you are coming back and say, you know, the family needs to be together. The community needs to be together and there is no way you can deal without them. And so you go to the family and tell them, look, don't retaliate, be calm, let's pray about it, let's do this, let's, let's follow justice. At the same time, you go to the family of the suspect whose children are also victimized. They are, they are looked at as the children of the killer. This particular case we went to, we were, the, the, the suspect was a neighbor. And these neighbors' children are in the windows, and no one wants to know about them. And they are hiding, look, peeping through the windows. They are in fear. And I started walking towards that house, and the child who was in the compound straight ran into the house. And I went and told them, look, it's not your fault. You know, give me a hug. Let's talk together. Let's, you know, and they need the same intervention as well if we are in. You know. So it's not on laws. It's on social 
uh, reconciliation, um, putting the community together in all aspects with all players, whether bad or good, so that we can make sure that we bring uh, laws together. If you look at uh, such a, a video, and that man, if you were there, if, you, if, if you're not, if it's not a call, just like the ambassador says, you just want to jump into his neck and arrest him and take him straight away. Again, I can't put the law into my hands because it is not my mandate to arrest such a person. And so I will take that to the courts of law, be patient, and, and see how. So we involve the community uh, in that way uh, of which doctors to make sure that they, we have the family focus groups, those families that have been affected, those families that are you know, affected in communities, as well as individual interviews. That's how we define community. Much as the traditional, real community of the African, Ugandan setting is still there in some parts, in many parts it's depleting. We have to define community in a new way that will bring justice, that will bring law, that will bring God's love into this work that we do. And we have, uh, in December this year, we had a, a case of a, an uncle who killed uh, one of the family members. We arrived late. And uh, this man was killed by the mob and set ablaze. In 2011, there was a man in Ginger who, was, who killed a child and carried the head of the child in a bag and was walking. They arrested him. The people killed him instantly. And that's, you, you want, this is another case of a mob justice where people just get somebody because they don't, they don't want to deal with the police. They mistrust now or they, they, they excited or they, they, they think that they are doing justice by killing somebody and that's not acceptable. And that's where people have come to, to go to mob justice. A lot of people have died and cases of mob justice have come from theft uh, in 2000 and um, in, 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 in theft in 2008, we had, I think, 232 cases of mob justice. There are cases of murder, robbery, witchcraft, and, and, and child sacrifice. A lot of them, if they are not protected by police, uh, they are killed. And uh, if also within the community, we come back and uh, make sure that we sit with them and say, no, you know, build back the community. Let's discuss. Let's talk about this. Let's, let's not look at the victim's family. Let's not look at um, uh, the, 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 you know, the suspects. Let's love them. Let's, let's, let's look after the children and be able to live as a community and a family. God's idea of family and community is still within us. Even when we seek justice, we cannot take it away from uh, you know, enhancing the rule of law in, in our lives. And I want to... Um, to, uh, to end by saying that as people of God, what we do as individuals uh, in our different positions, our professions, and fields as leaders is a spiritual assignment and a call. God has called us not to just see with our physical eyes, but to see with our spiritual eyes and insight and respond with love and compassion, and understand that amidst all this injustice, imaginable and unimaginable, the God of love can restore peace, justice, and love, and restore our families and communities. Thank you very much. So, uh, you know, it's interesting to have that last image of mob justice, or his last two images of mob justice. And it sort of takes things full circle because we think about, um, you know, things can be handled the traditional ways or the grassroots way. Obviously, mob justice is a grassroots way that we're not pushing for. And it shows you the importance of what uh, Mike Chibita is up to in the DPP's office. Because for if he can't build a system that people can believe in, that can deliver justice, they're going to keep doing that. Because that's why that happens, is because they feel like 
the formal system is not going to work. So we've got to take care of things now. And this guy's stolen a chicken before. He's stolen again. S two strikes, you're out, I think, typically. And, uh, and that's what's happening. So uh, it really shows you the importance of, you know, we talk about the grassroots systems are important, but also the formal systems are important for the people to gain trust in so that some of these things that we don't want to happen at a grassroots level, they feel like, no, we, we don't have to do that anymore. We can trust the police. We can trust the DPP's office to take care of these things and handle things right and justly and well. So interesting full circle. Okay, so we've got about 11 minutes for questions. So, yes, John. Yep. Thank you. Um, <coughs> thank you all for your presentations this morning and for participating, first of all. We very much appreciate the <laughs> very long travel and the time that you've taken to be here and for all of your insights. Um, and I think Brian, I have a kind of a question wrapped inside of a statement, um, but I think what Brian was just getting at and really the capping off the entirety of the of the symposium here and advancing the rule of law, there seems to be a lot of discussion, a lot of back and forth, uh, kind of two sides of the same coin between the, the customary and the community side of things and then the very formal side of justice and the governmental side of things. And, you know, there is, the exchange between Michelle Hughes and Brian yesterday, you know, between, well, you know, you don't want to totally subsume the customary, you want to give room for that, but at the same time, there needs to be some legitimization of it, and there needs to be a recognition of it formally. I'm wondering, and especially for Chief uh, Chibita and Ambassador Aguang, maybe, and, and obviously I'd like to hear from the rest of the panel as well, but where do you see maybe, um, one way on each side of that, the, that same coin. Where do you see ways in which Uganda and East Africa and developing nations in general can promote the healthy ways of um, the customary side, the communal side of justice and reconciliation, but then also promote the legitimization of the formal and the governmental side of justice? Well, I'll start because I'm on the side, not because I'm better place. These two sides are important. Understanding the customary approach and the, no, the, the, the legal approach, the governmental side. They're, they're both very, very important. And um, we need to understand that on a case-by-case -case basis, some of these situations comes up. It all depends on the community. It all depends on the people involved in a particular conflict. There are, there are a group of people who are not interested in going through the traditional reconciliation process. They really want to see the formal justice done. And uh, those ones are always very cooperative to the government, very cooperative to police in the process of investigation. But at the same time, you find a place where there are some loopholes. Evidence is not as watertight. And there's, there's likelihood that you may lose the case. And the accused is actually in prison. You don't want to see a situation where after a long time in prison, on remand, he's coming back very bitter, okay? And he's coming back to a community that is not prepared to receive him. So you want to have both systems working so that where you see people coming up and uh, on the disc uh, at the discretion of the DPP, he actually reads through the case and uh, where the cultural people, the traditional people have come up, he can even say, oh, thank God, this case actually is not as watertight. I think these people are right. I think we need to work with them. Uh, I need to see our best we can promote this process of reconciliation. And it would advise in a very good way to have the case handled. So I do believe that uh, both systems are important, but at the same time, 
just as we have been doing with PRMA, we need to continue teaching our people the law. People need to understand procedures of the law. They need to understand the differences between criminal law and civil law. They need to know the processes that cases go through. Even where they want to go through a formal, a traditional way of reconciliation, they need to know that it is also provided within the legal parameter for reconciliation, but they need to know what to do first. The first thing in that case would be handling it within the community, not necessarily coming to look for, you know, asking the DPP to release the offender, but the community need to first settle the matter down and be prepared to have the ground set for peaceful reconciliation of that conflict and uh, for a way where the offender can actually come back and be accepted. So I still believe that um, both sides are important, but people need to be educated. I don't know how government can legitimize uh, reconciliation. Uh, my constitutional mandate is prosecute all criminal matters. The reality is uh, sometimes I have to withdraw matters if uh, the people who are supposed to testify or the victims sign on and say we are no longer interested or we cannot testify for one reason or another, then uh, we are forced to withdraw that matter. Uh, I, I think there are, again, Dixon said uh, there is there is no offense that is uh, irreconcilable. <laughs> uh, basically, that takes the rug out of my statement, which I was about to make, and said that there are some matters which should not be <laughs> settled, reconciled, uh, and so on. Uh, case of Kony. Kony has been uh, leading a rebellion for donkey years, and they have killed people, they have mutilated people. Uh, but, you know, uh, and, and the Koyelo, and there's another gentleman called Achelam, who was a top commander of the LRA. He's, uh, again, we are in negotiation, and the government is saying we are using him to bring back some other people, and, uh, and everybody is like, when are you prosecuting this guy? So, there are some special cases. I guess as we learn in the law, it is the exceptions that make the, the rule. So for me as a chief prosecutor, uh, people have to take uh, criminal responsibility. But there are some exceptions. Yeah, yeah uh, I think part of the process uh, may involve looking ahead rather than looking back. And I think that uh, the challenges lie in the social and the economic um, integration. I can see, I mean, as I look at East Africa, that that social economic imbalance is um, among the people is a rise for future tension and future conflict. So in as much as we may try to solve, I mean, what has already gone before us, we need to study to stop what is going to come ahead. And uh, as long as people feel that one part has been advantaged at the expense of, of the other or on themselves, then they are going to try and take that out in some form of, uh, of uh, it's kind of like, let's take it back. This is our opportunity to take it back. So, and that's going to be always the the struggle uh, in in Africa, and especially, I mean, East Africa. So I think that uh, that we have to look at that um, more than um, even what has happened um, in the pa in in the past. Because if we don't, I can see many many more areas of 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 just conflict rising up based on the distribution of resources. Yeah. There's one very important point I want to note here. The strengthening of the civil division of the courts 
is one other aspect that is very, very important for these systems to work. I appreciate what DPP is doing. But over the years, you'll agree with me that many people end up bringing cases in court as a criminal case because they know the DPP is going to prosecute the case for free. Even when the case is actually civil in nature, at the end of the day, the DPP ends up with a huge backlog of cases he's not supposed to be handling. But the reason why they are coming there is just because they know the criminal process is faster. The police are all available for them, and the court actually is available for them. And they, instead of handling a case in a civil way, they will handle it in a criminal way. They will bring cases like criminal trespass, threatening violence on land disputes instead of taking to the land division. Because there they know they will require the representation of a lawyer and they don't have the money to pay for the lawyer. So for, for these systems to work actually, we need all branches of our courts to be functioning well. I have seen in courts the criminal division disposing of their cases very fast, but the civil cases, the lawyers, they keep on playing games. Because both parties are represented. Today the party is present, tomorrow the lawyer is not there for another reason. And the case takes so long. And then people start looking for another way of bringing it criminally. So um, there are some cases which are in cr of, of criminal or, or civil nature, which are brought in as a criminal case. Those cases can easily be reconciled using traditional means and using other means of settling disputes constitutionally by civil society actors like us, who are always available, uh, our people, are, I'm, I'm unfortunately I'm no longer there with them, who are always available to sit with people, facilitate a negotiated settlement, and they walk away knowing very well that there is no crime, and they're not compounding any felony. So there are a huge amount of civil cases that can easily be conciliated. That actually overweighing is, 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 is back. So I think, one thing, um, uh, you, 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 as you work in the system, I think there is a lot of need for reform and the strengthening of the civil division of our courts. Um, when you're seniors of law talk then, but I think uh, for me, if they are guiding competent laws, for me as an advocate and uh, of children, I have seen these grave abuses. I believe the Lord was in um, with the people that made these laws, and should uh, these laws should be given a priority as well. We can allow accommodation within the law that is, uh, you know, after the law has taken its course for reconciliation. I believe that the rule of law is there to give us a. a, a a ground, a strong ground that uh, there is no repeat of these injustices and, um, and the reconciliation and peace can come within the law and I'm believing that our God is a God of justice, justice must prevail and I think we should give the rule of law a priority as well as allow the reconciliation to take place. Well, thank you so much. Um, the way that Ernie is nodding his head, I think it's time to wrap it up. Is that the wrap it up nod? Yeah. Is there time for one more question? One more question, is that okay? Yes. Yes. Both of them will understand that you're going to need uh, two questions. If you have two more questions, you have to explain to me. Yeah. I just have one um, question that's maybe with a little bit of an observation from experiences of other countries that are using restorative justice, including here in the United States. And Virginia is actually one of the leading states in the United States in terms of using restorative justice in the criminal process, more for juvenile cases in this country. But there are other countries like Australia, which I think some of you've had some experience in, that use it widely um, in the criminal justice system. Um, and in terms of um, supporting the formal system through the use of restorative justice, which I think was the, the last question, one of the things that's useful is to really study what's going on. Um, so to have a good understanding of when cases are being referred out of the formal justice system, um, what's happening to them, and what the parties think. So how do victims think about it? How do the defendants or offenders think about it? Um, and the studies that have been done show that um, 
the defendants or offenders, as they're called, in restorative justice processes tend to find it much harder than a formal process would be um, because they're be really having to confront or be confronted by um, the victim. Um, when it's done well, it can be a long process. It's not necessarily short um, like a formal criminal uh, process might be. Um, they really have to um, accept responsibility and talk about what they've done and listen to the harm that's been inflicted. So, And the studies that have been done seem to show two things, that the offenders find it harder and victims find it more satisfying. So I think the concern about um, how victims are being treated in the criminal justice system, um, in a number of places they find that victims are more satisfied with that kind of a process. Um, but the, the point, um, which is really the question, is so far it sounds like there's a lot of um, restorative justice processes happening in a variety of ways in Uganda. Is there much study going on? So w really keeping records of what cases are being referred out, what's happening with them, and following up with these kinds of um, empirical qualitative studies of w how the parties um, feel about and are reacting to these alternative processes. Yeah, I can answer that question Briefly, hopefully, uh, in northern Uganda, there's all sorts of land dispute resolution going on, and there's a lot of NGOs um, that are doing their own versions of mediation or arbitration. Um, and what has happened is they did realize that they needed better data, they needed best practices, and what has happened over the last few years is they have all entered into a consortium. They're meeting regularly. They're going to actually meet on, I think, uh, March the 3rd, I think. They're all getting together again. They meet, it seems like, I think, four times a year. And they're sharing data. They're sharing, they're doing serious studies. Uh, and there's just a lot that's being generated in terms of best practices, how to best run a mediation in that context. Um, and so there's a lot of it, yeah, there's a lot of good um, empirical data that's being generated and there's a real effort by all the players to try to learn from this data regularly. So it's, it's exciting to see what they're doing up there with land in northern Uganda on that side of things. Um, I'd be happy to share you, get you on the email list for the group if you'd like um, and uh, or anyone else that would like to be on that list. It's interesting to see what they're what they're doing up there with that with that uh, collaboration. Um, do we have another? Yes. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Matthew Bryan. I'm an attorney in private practice from Atlanta. Um, my question really goes to the issue of restorative justice. Um, does not a just and proportionate punishment for crime actually further the goal of reconciliation and restoration. Uh, in, rel in relation to that, I have two follow-up questions, I guess, whatever order or, or just one of them you'd like to address. Do you feel like justice has been achieved and the rule of law advanced if a young girl is raped and murdered and the families resolve it by the gift of a goat? Is that just? Has the rule of law been advanced? Or is there some patent injustice in that? And then I guess my last question related to those is, if the just punishment of crime is not necessary to accomplish justice, why then did Jesus have to die? Thank you. Yeah, the other question was easier for me. To, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send this one to the panel, yeah. Uh, the last question, please, can you repeat it, sir? I think that was, if, if just, if punishment is not crucial, then why did Jesus, from a Christian perspective, well, Jesus' sacrifice? Well, I will start with that one. Jesus has already died and all sins have been forgiven mm -hmm. <laughs> in a simple way. He died and took away all the transgressions. Anyway, he has died and we are forgiven in a simple way. Punish, sin is bad and it is as bad that it attracted blood for it to be cleansed. This first question, um, I may somebody will answer this in another way, but that's how I see it. Uh, because I'm talking from a Christian perspective. Okay, the first one was about my daughter is raped. And uh, is it just for me to be paid a few goats or a cow? 
and let the offender go free? No. Absolutely no. I want to refer you back to the answer of Justice uh, Mike. It is a, on a case-by-case -case basis. Most times, offense is actually committed. The burden of proof is so tight that if we are to go through a full trial, we are not going to achieve. Thank God we now have, you know, plea bargaining on the way coming. But with my history of practice, many cases would be lost as a result of lack of evidence. Mostly in sexual offenses. I actually conducted a research on the, the impact of ignorance on the criminal justice. Our people are not well informed. My girl will be raped, but by the time the matter reaches police, there is no evidence. What will be required to prove penetration, all that, will no longer be there. And yet, she may be very eloquent to say, yes, it really happened, but there is no medical way to, uh, to prove that. You know, the scene of crime has already been tampered with. She has already bathed, and there is nothing else to, to get that could attach offender to the crime. But while the offender is in prison for on remand, he may be saying no, but from within him he knows he, he, he did it. And there is some discussion starts going on between the parties. And the prosecutor or the state attorney also knows the lacuna in the case. Where the parties actually reach a place of understanding. Sometimes the person who raped my girl is actually also maybe my nephew. There is also a relationship tied there. And you, they're looking at the entire community is impact of this case. The one going to prison is also a relative in case he's convicted. But at the same time, the case is not watertight. What do we do? So somehow, people start negotiating this case. And at the end of the day, some reconciliation is achieved, some compensation is done, you know. The girl's dignity maybe is protected by preventing her go through the entire years or months and years of trial, appearing in court as a witness and being ashamed, and at the end of the day, the court is ruling, you know, setting the, the victim, the, the, the offender free. But in case it was resolved earlier, through the negotiated settlement, after looking at the case, she would have, her image would have been protected, and, uh, you know, the harm to the community would have also been preserved and then there would be still that maintenance of coercion. So as I said, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Not that we are saying even on a case where there is watertight evidence and, you know, even where there's watertight evidence, sometimes people go ahead and reconcile. It is on a case-by-case -case basis. Oh, thank you very much. Of course, the issue of justice is very... Can I clarify one quick question? Maybe this is sure. I, I just wanted to clarify the question briefly, if I could. It, Really, the, um, the questions sort of presume um, that you have the proof and the evidence that you need. It's just a question of, is the goat for the rape and murder just? And does it advance the rule of law, or is it not? That, that really is, was, was the focus, um, because I, I do think that we all share the goal of advancing the rule of law and justice. Um, certainly, that's something I want to participate in. Uh, I just question whether or not so, so I guess I'm just trying to narrow the focus of my question. Are, are these two things equivalent? A goat for the life of a, a daughter, or is there something else that would be just and this unjust? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Justice is a very difficult uh, term, and uh, when you come to practicalities of uh, doing what is just to right a wrong, for, for me as a prosecutor, it is easy because uh, I go to prosecute and I know what I'm asking for. I struggled more with uh, justice as a judge, especially at sentencing, because uh, conviction is easy based on evidence. But now, especially before the sentencing guidelines came in, 
you could sentence somebody in a capital matter to one year or to death. I did sentence four people to death in my entire three years as a, as a judge, but, but it was one of the most difficult times because what sentence fits the punishment and what would be just for? You are not just thinking about the, uh, the convict, you are thinking about the victims. And you're trying to, so uh, it's very difficult. I could not tell you about a goat. Of course, a goat is a trivializing the matter. It is more symbolic, the way I, I look at it. Uh, I had a case of a, a pastor who had defiled a young girl, and the pastor was really broken from what I could see. He was crying through the, the trial and all. Uh, I convicted him and sentenced him to a term. But uh, the victim's family came to me and said, uh, okay, you've done your job, but uh, the pastor still feels like uh, he needs to do something more. He has come with money, and we don't want to take it outside the, the judicial system. Of course, I was thanked as official, but, but I could understand again. So I facilitated the pastor handing over some money to the family. He was going to serve jail term, but now this was again he, he felt it was not just enough for him to serve time. I think he felt he needed to hand over something tangible to the family of the girl. Nothing can really, in, in a situation like that, somebody has been violated. What is just really, I, I think a goat is just a symbol, a symbolic, but, but it can never, in my view, do justice to the crime that has been committed. Yeah, uh, I think I understand. Um, where the question is coming from. And uh, one of the challenges is this African appreciation of things that uh, um, simply in uh, acknowledging wrong, um, you know, can take it away. Or that we have a, a certain propensity of uh, forgiveness and accommodation that things can somehow absorb. On the other hand, uh, we also struggle with uh, what we see, uh, what you see on, on, on TV as people, I mean, prosecute cases here that you see, I mean, the other side so, I mean, vehemently opposed, you know, he has come to justice. I mean, justice has been achieved uh, just because the person has been convicted. Of course, you still see the pain in their heart because otherwise those they wouldn't be going to this extent. So how do you deal with that? And uh, I mean, especially, I mean, uh, as Christians, I think there's uh, two things there. One is uh, I realize that the system here, as it works, that I mean, that the law is the law, I mean, you face it, it brings accountability. I realize if somebody has done something and it's uh, your brother, whether somebody is your brother and he knows about it, he must report because he knows if he doesn't, he is going to be equally put in under the law and he will have to face it. So there is more accountability. And I think we have to bring that, I mean, on the other side of the globe so that people know, yes, they have to respect the law. It's not just going to be enough to, to bring a court and this is finished. It, I think the essence of law and punishment, I mean, is that it deters other people from doing uh, the same thing. They know that there's a consequence. So that part of the whole, I mean, criminal justice system has to be seen in operation. Now, the other uh, part of reconciliation and how you bring about uh, uh, forgiveness on the parties is what is going to work in our hearts as Christians and especially it, um, as judges um, to see how to, I mean, how do you accomplish that? Because when somebody wants to pay money in this kind of situation, it's, uh, they feel a sense of remorse. How do you help them come to terms with that? So I think that, yes, there is on our side of the continent uh, the need to really bring, I mean, the law is the law, and people need to see it that way so that they know when they've done something, there is a consequence, and they will have to pay for it. Yeah. Um, personally, I think that there is uh, no human conversation that is equivalent 
to any injustice committed. Um, the injustices are all evil driven and the realization that God is the extreme justice uh, I think will bring and change hearts because the people that are committed um, to, co to, to prisons and all that, again, it is those that are called by God to reach out to them for change. And so I think that Jesus dealt with it very well at Calvary and said that they, you know, they don't know what they're doing. We only pray that uh, God will lead us, I think, uh, in, in, in everything that we do as Christian lawyers and Christian servants of God. Yeah, and to just sort of, I guess, put another bow on something. When we think about different cultures, and you, you know, it's easy to take what is said and then put it in a newspaper headline and say, Africans give goats for raped and dead daughters. Um, it's important that, I mean, we think back at Moses, you know, in the time of Moses, what did they do when everything went wrong? They send a goat out, right? <laughs> That you had to tell the goat to leave. And then as Christians, it's a lamb, right? One lamb, really, you know. Uh, so I think, I think understanding that there's a symbolic piece here uh, is important. And, and I think we have to make sure we step out of our sort of cultural biases and remember maybe that means something more than we think. I mean, like in the, you know, if you're getting married, if you don't have the right number of tomatoes, it's a big deal. Because it means something. It's not that tomatoes are hard to get, you know. Tomatoes are very cheap in Uganda. So I think we have to always. Brian, I will just give out one personal testimony mm -hmm. to answer you, sir. Um, last year around this time, in January, I think John and uh, Abby was in Uganda as well. I lost my nephew was killed by a man who would have gone for manslaughter. And he would have gone in for 10 years. It so happened that I was home. By 9 p.m. he died around 1, I mean 7 p.m. By 9, 9.30, all these people had run away. I didn't know. I was coming back with him from the hospital, but the news about his death, he was hit. I rushed to the hospital within a few minutes, he was pronounced dead. I came back in the morning as he was seated as a family planning on how to arrange the funeral. I was told the family of the offender did not sleep home and they are busy ferrying their property away. I sent one of my confidants, whom they know and trust, to go and tell them to come back home. They came back home, and I told them, I'm not going to follow a criminal proceeding in this case. This home is called the Peace Village. I'm a peacemaker. I forgive whatever has happened. But I teach the young people to behave responsibly. Tell the young man, I'm concerned about his injury. He was also injured. And uh, they started standing up and making offers that they want to help us with the funeral. Before I knew it, they had four cows tied around my compound. I didn't ask them to bring it. But I forgave. My parents took my position, we forgave as a family. We have developed a culture of peace in our home and family. It was painful to go through the situation. But the greatest satisfaction I had was on the funeral, the day of the funeral, to see my father and the father of the victim carrying rushed flowers together, laying on the grave of my nephew. That was greatest justice that was done in that community. The people of that community learned greater lesson 
than if that boy was taken to prison. Oh, by now we are still going to court. They learn a Christian principle. But at the same time, I brought in practitioners, the regional police commander, the judge of the area was with me, my friends at the funeral, and they taught the community a lot. There is nothing you can pay for harm caused on you or on your loved ones. But the main thing, we know the government has a role to play. But we also have a role to play and an example to set as Christians. What would Jesus do? I may look very weak to have done that, but I believe Christ was glorified. It is symbolic for them to bring a cow or a goat or a sheep, but it will never pay. Even as I talk now, I feel the pain. But my joy and satisfaction is always when I'm driving in that village and meet the father of the offender and he's full of joy, greeting me happy. We are friends. We are a family. We bury their dead. We share their marriage functions. We remain one people. That is the message we are trying to convey to our people. It was not absolute murder. It would have been manslaughter. But we use it to bring glory to God. On a case-by-case -case basis, you can decide what happens to you or what you want to do with whoever offends you. It's your choice.